I'm here today with Rob Orchard, who's the co-founder of the Slow Journalism Company, co-editor of its flagship title, Delayed Gratification, and co-author of An Answer for Everything, 200 Infographics to Explain the World, which is such a ballsy title. I love it. We'll come to that later. (laughs) (laughs) Along with Marcus Webb, he has twice been named Independent Editor of the Year by the British Society of Magazine Editors. And prior to forming the Slow Journalism Company, he worked as editor of Time Out Dubai and Time Out Paris and ran a customer publishing company in Dubai. So welcome to the show, Rob. Very nice to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. Oh, it's so good to have you. And yes, we will definitely come to that hubristic title, which is glorious. And my son is completely in love with, as I I mentioned off air, but we'll come to that. But I want you to talk at the very beginning about slow journalism, because it's it's such a great... I can feel my breath just calming as I say it. And, you know, in a world of kind of Twitter and on and on and on and on. Why is it so important? What is it? Right. Very good question. So so slow, slow journalism, I suppose, was the way that we encapsulated the idea... Uh, that we were trying to embody in this beautiful magazine, so the late gratification magazine, world's best magazine. <laughs> I'm basically going to throw all the huge <laughs> at this. But so it's a beautiful quarterly magazine that we launched in January 2011. And at that time, there was a group of us, all of us editors, um, uh, we'd worked together for a long time, and we were looking out over the media landscape and it was just increasingly bleak. And this is 2011, bear in mind. So really, all of the really nasty, mad stuff you know, the deep fakes and the disinformation, you know, all that sort of stuff really was, was yet to come. Um, uh, and the kind of the bot farms and the, you know, the realisation that your phone is destroying your life and all these different things. Um, all of that, you know, we were all kind of in love with our phones. Everything was great. But the media world was, was really in a precipitous decline. You had all of these big titles, you know, like long established magazines and newspapers folding, um, cutting back, you know, the ones that survived, they were kind of cutting back on the amount of money they could pay people. They were getting much, much less adventurous. You were seeing the hollowing out that has only continued of local news. Um, So people were still sort of thrashing around and trying to find the model that was going to fund good journalism. And we had kind of educated people, not not you and I, but like people had been educated over 20 years to expect stuff for free online. And that turned out to be calamitous in terms of the production of good news journalism, because good news journalism is really, really expensive and it takes time and you have to be prepared to follow leads that don't kind of come off and you have to be prepared to invest in people. Um, and so all of that was going on. And at the same time, there was this idea that digital was the answer. Like digital is the future. It's going to sort everything out. Um, and all of these people sort of piling into digital without anybody actually having pointed at how they were going to make any money out of it. So we were looking out of that and we think it was all a bit dismal. And we were seeing these kind of, you know, we were seeing news shifting from being something that was mediated by editors to something that was mediated by what people were searching for online. Um, And, um, you know, that was kind of pitched as a positive, taking it out of the hands of a group of middle-aged people in New York and London. That's probably true as well. There's kind of quite a lot of that to to that as well. But what you were seeing was the start of things being led by Twitter um, and things being led by kind of celebrity and by clicks. So this um, idea that actually you would have people go into news organisations and instead of going out into the world and seeing what they thought was important, they were being told what to write about based on what people had been searching. So all of that was going on. So we, we were horrified by this and we were all big print people um, and we loved making magazines. And so we wanted to do a quarterly magazine that was the opposite of that. So instead of being speedy and knee-jerk and immediate and giving hot takes, it would take its time to a ridiculous extent. So it would wait for three months after events had happened, until the dust had settled. And it would look back over the events of a quarter at a time, and it would pull out the stuff that genuinely mattered. So get rid of all of the white noise and the fluff and the PR spin and all of the gubbins. Just go back to the stuff that was important, stories that other people had missed or mistold because they were trying to do them so fast, and ask the question of what happened next. And so that has been our format. Um, and it was always a kind of a, a bit of an experimental magazine. It was always going to be advertising free. Um, so it's always been free of advertising, supported uniquely by readers and subscriptions um, and non-partisan. So not coming from one political uh, spectrum, side of the spectrum or, or another, just, you know, basically a magazine about ideas and trying to invest in good journalism. And it's been one as well where we've just tried to be increasingly ambitious with the sort of journalism we do, places we send people, the amount that we invest and so on. So that was the background. And so slow journalism for us was just a way of encapsulating that feeling that um, when you take your time, you can do something of more quality. Not always, um, but, you know, it's a bit like there are parallels with uh, slow food and slow travel, you know, both of which were reactions against, you know, slow food, obviously reaction against fast food. 
this idea of something is missed mm. through computer speed and that actually if you want quality sometimes you have to take more time yeah. so that has been our, our voice you know that's been our, our kind of idea and it was a bit of a voice in the wilderness i think for the early years which was quite good for us because we got quite good coverage from people it's like who are these chumps yeah. you know doing a quarterly print magazine um and it's always been a niche concern this is not a massive mainstream kind of big title but it's now got like a nice dedicated group of subscribers that support it and um i guess we've continued to try to champion that and i think it's become more evident to people because you know as you as you touched on the sheer speed and overwhelming nature of the 24 7 news culture that we inhabit um makes us anxious Mm -hmm. constantly on the back foot you know like reaching for our phone every time there's an update sometimes when there are children and like other interesting people in the room that need attention but you know like our, our minds are zoned out on so something that comes along once every three months and gives you a screen break and says don't worry you don't need to concentrate on the flim and the glam and the kind of your gubbins um, 24-7, you can actually just get this and catch up. That's quite nice. Yeah, you, there's a real well-being aspect in that, uh, which I think is also true about writing, actually, a completely different subject, but writing by hand is a similar sort of just taking yeah. yourself out. Fascinating to hear your analysis of the challenges that the magazine industry was, was facing, because of course I was in the book publishing industry at the same time, very similar thing, you know, what is the model here? Everybody wants everything for free, how do we make that work? And Gosh, there's so many ways you could go with this. I really want to talk to you about how magazines are positioned alongside books in the content ecosystem. But let's let's go first, I think, to that the fact that you have made it work in what is actually an incredibly difficult business model. You know, it really was, as you say, it was the business model that was driving the, the end of journalism as we knew it. it was, we could we just we couldn't put stuff out for free. And how do you get to the point? where you have got enough people who know about you, who care enough about you, who are prepared to spend some cash to get what is actually a beautifully produced magazine. I mean, the paper quality, everything about it is is gorgeous. It's not a cheap magazine to produce. But what, where was the step that took you from this is a great idea to we can make this work financially? Well, I think so, to be honest with you, it was um, it was a combination of total naivety and bloody mindedness. Because, you know, like, honestly, I, I think that the best magazines are probably launched not by, you know, publishing professionals who calmly sort of evaluated the market and looked at the demographics and you know, worked out how they're going to take this to the market, all that sort of stuff, um, and who the advertiser is going to be and how it's going to fit in with other things. I think they're made by people who bloody mindedly, you know, like want to pursue the bee in their bonnet. So it's just like, so, you know, you feel a compulsion, right? You, you want to produce something, you want to get it out there. So we did that. And we had, if you look back to our early projections, such as they were, I mean, they were, bear in mind, so this is like, this is five journalists and an art director, none of whom have got any practical kind of financial experience at all. Um, And none of whom have really kind of, you know, like done anything serious in the UK in terms of business. And if you look at those projections, they're laughable. They're the projections of a total fantasist. Like, oh yeah, you know, maybe we can, maybe we can sell like 5,000 copies of, Issue one, you know, or that stupid thing that everybody does. I mean, but but actually probably most people don't do, but you're like, you know, there's 66 million people in the country. So all we've got to do... (laughs) We only need 0.1% of them. You know, and then to get them to buy an obscure print publication that, you know, like that probably doesn't fit into their lifestyle at all. That's all we've got to do. So, um, and so just, just I'm going to step in there because that is hilarious. I get so many proposals in the chat that say, you know, I've, I've quantified the market and they, and they say there's this many million people in this space. So if we get 0.1% of those, well, it does not work like that. It's absolute nonsense. absolutely just jazz thinking. And so um, so there was that. And then it was just, you, you, like, you keep making each issue. Um, and for the first three and a half years, like we, uh, we didn't, take any money out of it so we were just you know like working freelance evenings and weekends just to keep the wolf from the door and it was really really tough it's very very hand to mouth I remember doing sort of things where I was just thinking well look if I can just you know if I can put off the printer for another kind of two weeks then I can move this money about I can do this and, you know it was all kind of a bit grim but it was also delightful like I mean you know making a making a publication is one of the nicest things that you can do as you know it's just kind of just a very creative lovely thing if you do it with people um that you are very kind of close with, as I have, and you, that you really, really respect, you know, a small team of people that you just all think they're all absolutely brilliant, then there's nothing nicer in the world. It's, it's lovely. So it was kind of a mixture of kind of like bullish disregard for reality, um, being infatuated with what we were doing, and I suppose also being at that stage in life. So 
this was, you know, like I had a kind of a three and a half year run before I had my first kid. And I could not have launched this after having the first kid because I just wouldn't have had the energy and I would have been far too worried about like it, it making money. And then, you know, it's been, it's been hand to mouth. It's been a little bit at a time and we found other revenue streams. So, you know, infographics turned out to be a massive thing for us. We've taught a lot of infographics in big organizations. We've made um, infographics for organizations at, at various times. Um, and then we've tried to do these extra things like you know, making a book and, and you know, we're, we're working on some other projects at the moment. So, you know, a little bit of time. But I mean, you know, I wouldn't want to give the impression that we're now like awash with cash, having finally cracked the answer to independent magazines. Independent magazines is like an economically very precarious business model. And certainly, you know, uh, it's one of the things as well where, you know, it, unless you've somehow got into the space of being a need to have for your customer, then when you're a nice to have, then you're one of the first things that yeah. when they're going through their direct debits that they will kind of cross off the list at a time like this when everything's kind of price of everything's going through the roof. So it's not a it's not that we've solved it, but we have got to a stage now where everybody's paid and you know like the, the business feels like it's got some stability and, and we can keep growing. And it's interesting you talk about um, the infographics as well. I want to pick up on those. It's what you almost say they're like a byproduct, that, and, and then they they develop their own revenue stream, which is really interesting. Tell me how yeah. the infographics came along, why you realised so quickly that they that they were so important, and, and why they matter, why they work so well. Yeah, no. Um, so so my um, my co-editor Marcus, who had a real bee in his bonnet about them. Um, so he's a very he's a very big publishing brains on Marcus, and um, so we were working on this magazine together in late 2010, um, and David McCandless's book, Information is Beautiful, oh, had yes. come out a little bit before. And we were looking at it like, this is, this is kind of really, this is super exciting stuff. And so we were talking about it, and Marcus really pushed, he said, look, we need some points of difference for the first issue. Let's get some infographics in there. And we were very lucky to be blessed with um, world's best art director, Christian. And so he just kind of took this and ran with it. And then it just became part of it. And the reason it became part of it, I think, is twofold. Number one, it's a brilliant way to condense three months or three years or 300 years worth of data into um, a kind of an easily digest digestible story. Um, so this, from the slow, slow journalism angle, if you get it right, it's quite kind of nice like that. And the number two thing is for any publication, there's, there's something about having ebbs and flows, right? Light and dark. You can't get to the end of a 10 page feature about how awful everything is in DRC and then turn the page and go into a 10-page feature about how awful everything is in Yemen. It just it kills you. You'll stop reading. You know, the reader is a human who needs to, you know, like have a respite from how awful things are in the world. So we've kind of used it as a way of of kind of, of producing rhythm in the magazine. So, you know, full stops and kind of, you know, like um, nice little palate cleansing moments between more things. It's an amuse bouche. Okay. It's an amuse bouche. And, um, and also, to extend the metaphor um, into a slightly kind of grimmer realm, it's like a gateway drug, I think. <laughs> so I think it's quite difficult to sell people on, um, you know, just on a, a book full of kind of like long form journalism that comes out once every quarter. And then they pick it up, the new standard pick it up, and they're like, oh God, £10, well, that sounds a bit pricey. And then they kind of start flicking through. And when I look at when I see clock somebody in Smith doing that, it's never the long form features that they stop on. Those beautifully researched things that we sent somebody for weeks to do something, we legaled it and we wrangled it and we subbed it and gone back and forth. Um, you know, it's the nice little infographics, the funny little facts that have been illustrated and catch people, and that's what they show people. And you know, so they're brilliant for getting people to engage. And you know, when we when we do teaching in big organisations, very often we talk about that. You know, if you want somebody to engage with your report or your presentation, or you want somebody to kind of take a bit of time with a broader story, this is a great way to drag them in. This is like the infographic is the gateway drug um, for your for your bigger story. Yeah, and it's not easy to do, but then it's not that hard either. It's, I think thinking visually is a skill like any other. You can develop it. One of the ways of doing it is looking at how people do it. So I would commend to you both the both delayed gratification, but also the book and answer for everything. And honestly, that that's what my, my son is hooked on your gateway drug because he What's just he no, took book. Cool. He can, he's, my fourteen year old son cannot get enough of an answer for everything. I think this is because he feels he has an answer for everything, and he just oh. feels a kind of kinship with it. But uh, yeah, there's that sense of he he's he's like a sponge with fun. Acts. Yeah. But if I, I know that if I'd sat him down with, you know, four pages of closely argued text, I'd have got nowhere. Give yeah. him an infographic, 
all over it. It's it, and I don't think humans it's humans. I don't <laughs> he's human, obviously. I don't think that's any different. <laughs> humans are no <laughs> oops. <laughs> Don't let your son listen to this. <laughs> no, well, he won't. It's his mum. He won't listen. <laughs> well, no, that's really that's really interesting. So there, I think there is a generational thing there. I think, you know, so actually when we have occasionally done reader surveys um, and we've kind of sort of matched it with demographics, we've asked people, should we have more or fewer demographics in the book? We get about 50% of the readers who are the younger readers saying more and about 50% of the older readers saying fewer. So we've kind of kept the same number. Um, but it's definitely, it's definitely, and I've had, conversations with older relatives you'd be like look how do i read this i don't really kind of get it which is much more intuitive for, for young people i think and you're right that there's nothing actually there's nothing difficult about infographics they are mysterious but they're not complicated now i say that as not being the designer so um, <laughs> and I, we are I find the, them very easy <laughs> I, all i do all you have to do is you just have to tell a man <laughs> to make them, and he makes them <laughs> it's really not difficult. No, so, the rest of us, though, Rob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, so, um, so, uh, so, Marks and I do. We we, we do everything uh, in tandem with Christian. So we develop the whole thing together. So, what we all say in our classes is this: there are no good infographics without good stories. Which seems quite an obvious thing to say, but actually, the vast majority of infographics that are produced, and it is a absolute deluge out there, particularly in the business world. The vast majority of them are a complete waste of time and marketing budget and you know design effort because they don't con- contain a relatable human story at the heart of them, the sort of thing that you would genuinely want to tell your friends down the pub. And you are much better off enshrining one of those stories in a 3D pie chart made in Microsoft Paint, you know, like 1998 version, than you are doing a bells and whistles illustrator thing with moving parts with a story that doesn't resonate with people. So you can make stuff very straightforwardly. And there's all sorts of free software. You know, Infogram is absolutely brilliant now. Like, there's very few things that you would want to do that you couldn't do with that. And then all you need is the principles. So actually, so we run these regular classes for, um, well, they're disc- discounted for subscribers, but also non-subscribers very welcome. Uh, we run them online, uh, slow-journalism.com. And it's just kind of two hours. And what we do is we take you through um, from the beginning. So like what infographics are, how they work, how humans process data visually, how you get to a really good story, once you've got your good story from the data and how you set about kind of, you know, parsing data to get this, how you then, you know, know instinctively what sort of design is going to work for it. And then you're away. Um, and then it's just kind of, it's just practice. So yeah, I mean, I think there's, it's, it's, it's not difficult, but there's a lot of people doing it wrong. Yeah. If you meant to just make that sound simple, I'm not sure you succeeded there, Rob. It does sound like quite a lot of stages, actually. <laughs> but I would recommend that people yeah, have a look at the course. There's no way you're going to give us five minutes and, and we've got the thing. So I get that. But yeah, they, I mean, they work extremely well. Let me come back to that point that I, I flagged earlier about, uh, because actually at £10, the magazine is straying into kind of book price territory, as well as the, the way it's doing it. So how do you see so you've almost created a niche within within the content ecosystem you know we're used to having magazines we're used to having books and here's this thing that's kind of in between the two mm. which is really interesting have you ever thought about it in those terms how do they relate together so so for the longest time we've pitched delayed gratification as being halfway between um a very slow magazine and a very fast history book and sort of mm. you know, sort of sitting somewhere on that on that scale uh, that kind of bookazine thing when we launched wasn't there wasn't really the same sort of thing for it so if you were a bookazine in smiths then you were like a you know a standalone guide to how to use ipads for pensioners right or, and you had this special section so you could go through the books and thing now it's much more common because there's been this unbelievable wave of independent magazines kind of coming out and equally when we came out so we came out we cost 10 pounds um issue one january 2011 and actually as in this next issue we're going to go up to 12 pounds because the cost of paper has gone up by 26% in the last year. Um, and so uh, and, and so is everything else, obviously, um, by small amounts, but still significant. But, yeah, so so £10 at that stage was outrageous, because most of the magazines kind of around it were sort of £2. But now, actually, it's not that mad, you know. Um, magazines have really shut up over the last 10 years, haven't they? You struggle to find a decent magazine for less than £5. Most are in the £5 to £10 bracket, but then you've got all of these independent magazines, you know, that are selling for £15 plus. Which so, is fascinating, actually, because books haven't really done the same. No, no, they haven't, have they? The differential is closed. Yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's all sorts of services that are not set up for this style of thing. You know, there's services set up for books. There's services set up for weekly and monthly magazines with rapid turnover. But distributors, 
um, and marketing things and subscriptions organizations and all these different things were not geared up at the beginning for, for that kind of that quarterly subscription sort of thing. That has changed a lot. There's a, there's a lot more opportunity if you wanted to launch this sort of thing, then you can do it and much more straightforwardly. And so we also teach a lot of classes in how to launch an independent magazine. And there's such an interesting appetite in it. And there's a lot of people who I think, you know, are trying to work out whether they would rather write a book. You know, lots of people talking about whether they would like rather like, like um, to write a business book or actually they think that there's something with a bit more regularity that they can put out there. And as you know, you know, with a book, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you've got one chance. And if you seize a particular moment and if the PR people are brilliant and if everything's in your favour... And if maybe, you know, like a similar title has come out and done really well or whatever, like all of these different things align, then in that brief window where you're a novelty, you can just fly. But actually, you can have written the best thing in the entire world and those things not align and it just not really kind of take off. So there's something about the kind of the quarterly thing of just building up people, building up like people over a more protracted period of time, getting them on direct debits and then having something to build from that I think, you know, can work really, really well. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I hadn't, I don't, I don't know whether I hadn't just picked up on it, but that, that I'd noticed that the, the increase in price of, of magazines, but I hadn't noticed the growth in that bookazine space. And uh, you've, you've, you're so enthusiastic about it, you make me want to go and, and publish in that space. So well, yeah. uh, come to my class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also, for- I've got stacks of free time, me, I should certainly do that. <laughs> <laughs> but for, for a crash course in what's going on out there, Go to Mag Culture. It's this amazing, I mean, there's loads of them, but this amazing independent magazine store in London. And just, you know, like spend two hours going around because you will be astonished by the number and the, the variety and the quality of the independent publications that are just kind of coming out. And, and part of it is also, it's just journalists coming up. Like you've still got all of these kids who want to become journalists and they, you know, they're doing the courses and they're coming out graduating. And they're finding that there the just isn't the pathway in. There aren't the jobs. There's no kind of like starter jobs in local news that they can then move on. So they're kind of finding a back door. And so they're publishing these things. They're not necessarily meant to last for years and years and years, but they're just kind of a calling card. They're showing that we can do this. We can do some amazing things. So you get this, this flurry of creativity and incredible publications, and then it kind of dies away again. But it, does, it always doesn't matter. Like the ephemeral nature of it is, is sort of part of the beauty, I suppose. Part of its charm, yeah. And it's really interesting as well, like, you know, that contrast between mass journalism, which is struggling so, so much, unless you're really, you know, really big ones. And then this sort of, you know, Thousand Flowers flourishing, that, that sort yeah. of just, you know, the deep niches where people can really make a mark. Yes, definitely. I mean, I guess we've seen it everywhere. I mean, kind of, you know, like podcasting is an incredibly mm. democratic thing from that point of view, with far lower barriers to entry than printing something. And so that sort of thing has, has kind of has, has flourished as well, I suppose. I mean, I suppose what you don't see going into a place like mag culture is the sheer attrition rate. You know, like yes. I've, I've, I've sort of often wondered about doing a an infographic where you just track the last 10 years, the sheer number of magazines that have launched and then the average lifespan of each, you know, um, because a lot of them are hemorrhaging cash from the beginning. And, you know, yeah. even though they look, they're, they're kind of, they're doomed. Yeah, that's what they say about publishing, isn't it? How to make a small fortune in publishing? Start with a large one. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I always ask my guests, Rob, for a, a best tip. Now, let's just look at writing generally, not sort of books per se. But if somebody's listening to this, they want to do more writing for their business, in their business, what one thing would you say to them? I'm going to do, I'm going to do two things. Um, you okay. go I don't want to dis- destroy like, the premise of the show. There's the format gone. Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> You're definitely going to edit this out afterwards. <laughs> oh, one thing. Right, one thing. Um, yeah, so uh, two things, and both very obvious. Both I find incredibly useful. Um, so uh, the number one thing is walking. Um, so this morning, I started my morning, as I do every time. So I go out to Margate to work with um, our, our very, the, the Christian, and it was a lovely bracing morning in Margate, and so we went out with his dog, Arthur, beautiful Patterdale Terrier, just in what I can only describe as a sort of a, a tutu. He's got this kind of like elaborate winter wear that he, he sort of wears, which is very jolly. And so he went out along... We're still talking about the dog here, right? <laughs> exactly. We're all in tutus. <laughs> this is the second secret, yeah. No, um, so we go down the beach. And actually, just that kind of like the, the very fact of moving and talking with somebody, not face-to-face, but sort of next to one another, seems to be incredibly good for generating ideas and for letting things happen. Yeah. So we find those super, super, super productive. I'm just kind of long walks. I come back and you've got 12 ideas off the back of it. That's amazing. And I have been through phases when I've been writing and editing very intensely. 
where I have really tried all of the tricks to force myself to do that, you know, just to physically get up and just go, even if you feel like you can't possibly because there's too much to do, you will treble your kind of, um, your, your rate um, yeah. after that. Here, here. And the other thing I think is about editing is that I have found the very best thing with editing is to um, not edit on screen. Um, I think you mm -hmm. print things out and you need to get an old fashioned red pen you sit in a comfy armchair and circle round stuff. And it's, it's maybe a bit like what you were saying about when you sort of write stuff by hand, but a bit of the brain is activated when you are kind of scoring stuff. Yeah, there's a kinesthetic connection. I don't know what it is that goes on, but it's so much easier to see what's wrong with stuff yes. um, than it is. And actually, I do have a final um, tip on that, actually, which is when you're writing a chapter or a long-form feature, whatever it is, it's incredibly easy to lose the thread of your argument. And this is nine times out of ten you know, when I have a problem with a piece that I'm editing, that's that's what's happened. It's, the thread of the argument is gone. And so I worked out this thing a while back, which is it's very, very difficult to follow an argument over a 6,000 word piece or a chapter or a bit like So what you do is this, you make a copy of the piece and you go through, put in a paragraph break after each paragraph and on top of each paragraph, you write what the paragraph is for. And then you go through and delete all the paragraphs. And then you've just got sort of a page or a page and a half, which is just literally a bullet point, you know. And it's basically a way of going back and restructuring. And, and then it's incredibly simple to see, yeah, that doesn't follow from that. And that's not marrying for that. And then you have to do that thing. This is four. This is point four. Oh, my God. I'm actually destroying your podcast format. This is awful. But point number four is that at that stage, um, you have to do what my business partner, Marcus, used to refer to as killing your, killing your darlings. So you have to be prepared to chuck out paras that you love and that have got amazing quotes and hilarious anecdotes because they just don't fit with what you're actually trying to say. Um, so but I, I misheard kill your darlings as clean your Daleks. And I was just wondering where that was going. It's important that you must at that point <laughs> clean your Daleks. <laughs> Dirty Daleks are the <laughs> of good publishing, as we all know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure heavyweight didn't didn't put it that way. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's, it's it's only because Daleks didn't exist, but otherwise he would have been all over. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I'm, I'm actually terrified to ask you now which book you recommend because there could be you know your whole library is going to come up now. Think, well, actually, so do you know what I was thinking about this, and um, I had a very delightful break with my family on the Isle of Wight earlier this year. And a friend of mine, um, a very good friend of mine, gave me a copy of the four-hour working week before I went away. Mm, Tim Ferriss. Yes. And I'm sure a lot of people have recommended this before. Now, a lot of it, I was reading it. I was like, you, I mean, it was, I think it was writing in 2007. And he was, I don't think he was a man that was burdened down by like the weight of kind of middle age and children, all that sort of stuff. So a lot of the stuff he was saying about this aspirational lifestyle where you can live like a millionaire and flip around the world. I was like, dude, I'm not doing any of that. I know that is relevant to me. <laughs> not going to happen. Um, and uh, a lot of the kind of the test cases, testimonials, I wasn't completely convinced by. But I mean, it was another world as well. You know, it was a world where you were mm -hmm. just discovering all of these you know, apps and so on that could, could revolutionize where you work and so on. But there were a few things in there that I took away from it. So I took away um, this stuff about batching and automization of processes, which is a very obvious business thing, um, but one that small businesses struggle with. Um, and sort of feeding into that as well, small businesses run by, you know, kind of individuals and or small groups of people. There's a massive tendency to do everything yourself uh, because you can do it better than everybody else. And the thought of somebody else to do it worse than you is mad. But he, he talks about how you have to get out of that mindset, which is completely correct. Um, you know, as, as somebody actually we had a business advisor a few years ago who was getting frustrated with me for, for just keeping everything in to myself. He said, what, what's, what, you know, what's going to happen here? Are you going to end up buying a printing press and printing it in your own home? You have to give stuff away, otherwise it's just kind of completely stupid. Um, and I think there's stuff in there as well about, um, which again is so obvious, but also so ignored, um, particularly I think by independent publishers, um, which is to give customers what they want, not what you think they want. Um, and so to genuinely look at what it is that people now? I, as I've said, I'm very bad at that because what we tended to do is just make a magazine we want to read, and then hope that people coalesce around it. But trying to think about that um, a lot more in terms of our processes. So, you know, if I was a subscriber to this magazine, what would be the ideal type of service that I would get? What, how would I want to be able to change my subscription? You know, move things about, switch from quarterly to annual, whatever it might be, and trying to get all of that stuff. And you know, if I was a subscriber in Australia. How would I want to receive this? What digital components would I want to have? All that sort of stuff. So quite obvious stuff, but quite often the best business books 
they just coalesce stuff that you instinctively knew anyway, but they just... You didn't have the words for, yeah. And actually, that last point you make is so interesting because you separate out the editorial and the kind of the process. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which is really important because the the whole point about giving people what what they want is the Henry Ford thing, isn't it? They just just flaster horses. You know, there there is a a, a space for actually giving them what you're passionate about and and hoping it finds its people. And as well as that, you can give people what you have created in the way that suits them best. So separating out those two aspects is really interesting. That's true. I think it's just, it's also, I think people, when they start their own small business, quite often think that they want to reimagine absolutely everything from scratch. So for example, um, we reimagined the contents page for our first few issues of the magazine. And we redid each one as a, in the graphic. And it's still in the graphic, but now it's much, much easier to read because we realized that actually it was quite complicated. And the other big thing was for years, we didn't have page numbers. Because everything in the magazine was done around dates, and so we thought, oh, this is like innovative. We're so like we're so iconoclastic that we've done away with page numbers. Until one point, you know, somebody said, sort of, I think it'd be really quite useful to have page numbers in here. And we put them in, and having page numbers was a big revelation. It was like, it's, oh wow, you know, like we've seen a lot. Can you imagine? <laughs> Huge innovation. Uh, that's hilarious. As a book publisher, no, I'm actually getting a little cold sweat just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, page indexing very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. And we've gone way over time and it's all good. It's absolutely fantastic because I wouldn't have wouldn't cut out a bit of it, but possibly your eighth tip, yes. but you know. Um <laughs> where <laughs> there's so many options here. The courses, the magazine, the book. Tell us where people can go to find out more and find So just go to slow journalismcom and you can uh see um the back issues that we've got. So each issue of the magazine we get a different artist from around the world to uh do the cover for us. And so our very first cover was Shepherd Fairy, and we've got Shepherd Fairy back in to do. Um, he did uh, our 50 year anniversary and our 10 year anniversary. We've had Ai Weiwei, we've had Michael Craig Martin, we've had Beatrice Mill Hayes, Grayson Perry, all sorts of good people, and then all sorts of kind of um, up and coming artists as well. So you can see that, and you can sort of you can get a kind of a flavour of the magazine there. Um, there's loads of our um, beautiful infographics and some of our longer form stories on the blog. You can get them the, the book and answer for everything there. You can book tickets. We've got tickets in how to make infographics coming out, how to launch an independent magazine. There's our TEDx talk talking about um, slow journalism, what it is and why we think it matters. So that's probably the place to head to, I'd say. And um, there's, uh, ooh, we've got a promo one at the moment as well. So if anybody wanted £5 off the magazine, there's uh, an early bird promo and the, and the code is early bird. Just the words early bird, all one word, and that gets you £5 off a subscription, which makes it very affordable and a terrific Christmas gift. Now, given that this is going to be out on the internet forever, we need to date stamp yes. that. So tell us when that code expires. That's a good question. Well, I mean, actually, an early bird code, by implication, ought to expire quite uh, quite early on, oughtn't it? It'll definitely be good. I mean, do you know what? I'm just going to say now, um, I'm going to take the decision that I'm just going to leave it open for a good few months now. So I reckon as, as long as it's, you know, like by the end of February or something, my marketing manager will be about early. Okay. So but if you're listening to this before the end of February 2023, yeah, we, you should be good. Exactly. Get on there and have a look. Concept of early bird, but yes, that would be good. Fantastic. So much fun talking to you, Rob. And I feel like we've covered quite a bit of ground there. And I hope it's been really, really useful for, for people. I'm definitely going down to my culture yeah. tomorrow. And uh, oh yeah, I'll see you all there. All right. Good to see you. Thank, Thank you, you so much.